So I always say the, the only fair comparison that you can do is your current self with your previous self and your future self. That's it. Mm. Yeah. And every day you make a small step and you get better. And next time you walk up on stage and your heartbeat is heart rate is not at 180, but at 170. That's a major success. Yeah, it goes down. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Get comfy, snuggle up, grab your morning coffee or your evening cocoa, get a blanket, maybe some popcorn, because it's story time. Today we are speaking to Thomas Schutter, whose job is to tell stories and also teach people how to tell stories, literally. His job title is Chief Storyteller, and he works for a big German uh, data company, SAP. Thomas, welcome. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's so great to be on your show. What an honor and a pleasure. I'm looking forward. Yeah, yeah, we are very interested, personal interest in storytelling, I think, especially as creatives and just general human beings. <laughs> the, Maybe. It, it, actually, it, it is part of our nature. Uh, as the, the brain, and, and this is what neuroscientists are finding out more and more, is, is mm -hmm. wired in stories. So the way we store information, the way we learn, the way we do things is all captured in the form of stories inside. So yeah. it's quite natural too. <laughs> and we are all storytellers. We cannot work around. We, we are all telling stories all day long. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, yeah, famous saying from Paul Watzlawick, you cannot not communicate Everybody knows that, I think. And uh, I like to take it even further. I say, uh, you cannot not tell a story. So whatever you do, every move you make, every step you take, every breath you take, every bond you break, that's going to be part of the story that you're telling, no matter what. So you cannot work around. That's, that's cool. good news and bad news, because yeah. it's about the quality of the stories that you mm -hmm. tell. And that's what I'm trying to influence a little bit to make uh, my colleagues tell better stories in the field, mm -hmm. to customers, to the public, wherever. Mm -hmm. and also internally, of course. What an amazing job to have. Can you give us a oh, yeah. background on like, how did you get into this? How does one become a chief storyteller? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's something that I planned already when I was very young. So the first step you need to do in order to become a chief storyteller is to plan a career as a musician, which I then <laughs> uh, canceled last minute to study chemistry and uh, to make a PhD 10 years. <laughs> to work two years in chemical industry to find out that you want a job in the IT industry, I went to SAP, and then it took me 12 years in SAP to find the right person, a great Jeez. storyteller. His name is Ian Kimball. Hi, Ian, if you listen to this, uh -huh. thank you very much again for infecting me with this storytelling virus 12 years ago. And uh, that was the turning point. Yeah. So you see, my CV is not really straight, but mm -hmm. it was fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> since then, I'm, I'm really looking into everything related to communication, human-human mm -hmm. human interaction. I'm, I'm studying neuro-linguistic programming since many years, which I find a very fascinating field mm -hmm. as well. And yeah, and that's it, basically. The, the, wow. if, 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 uh, now, jokes, jokes aside, of course, uh, if, if you ask me how, how to become... Uh, so I think uh, the, the main thing you need to, to have or to get is to fall in love with uh, language. Mm -hmm. That's what I found out. So if, if you're really into words, into the sound of words, into wordplay, um, mm -hmm. double meanings, uh, alliterations, and mm -hmm. all these, these fancy things, that is the starting point. When, because storytelling is, is the art of playing with words. Mm -hmm. yeah, the verbal storytelling is, is about that. And uh, if that's not fun, then yeah, it will be a hard time. Mm -hmm. So that would be my... My nice. take on that and this curiosity and um, yeah, and and doing it that's that's most important because we always only learn when we're doing things. It's not about mm. reading a book and then ah now I know the theoretical concept of storytelling and that's it. No, I need to really practice, 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 mm -hmm. like in every other 
uh, profession. And I know you, you as designers, you haven't been designers uh, like this. Yeah, so you have mm -hmm. uh, found your passion for it, and then you practice it, and then you try it, and you get creative, and that's the same thing. Yeah, just uh, sure. That's a it's a lengthy journey. Can can we zoom into the part where, so you you moved away from your chemistry or trade in chemistry and then you stepped into the technical space and started working for SAP. What happened? Where were you introduced to the world of storytelling? What was your first job to, you know, get into this field? That was actually what we uh, call a fellowship inside SAP. Yeah. That's a fantastic thing, I, I would say, in my world, is uh, where you get a six-month assignment to uh, another place inside this company. So we are quite a big company in SAP mm -hmm. with 100,000 uh, plus employees worldwide. And so this is a chance to leave your current job for some time and to try out something new. And that, oh. that is how it happened, actually. This this guy called Ian Kimball, I mentioned him already. Mm -hmm. Second time. <laughs> <laughs> He offered one of those fellowships. And uh, so I, 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 I saw him on stage in my first year at SAP. And I was really like, I said, wow, this is this stage presence, this this coolness, this uh, humor. The, this was the package. And I really said to myself, I want to work for this guy. And it took, unfortunately, 12 years to get there. And then, uh, as I said, I found out uh, my passion for that. So what, what I did, it was the first thing we did was to uh, organize those big events. Like uh, we, we call our main uh, trade fair Sapphire. Mm. You might have heard about that. Yeah. And uh, there's a technical conference called TechEd. So these are... Uh, big conferences with uh, up to 20,000 uh, participants. Sure. And so I was, uh, part of my job was to organize all the demos and writing the demo stories and making sure nothing goes wrong on stage. And it was a wonderful world, or this backstage world at the big conferences. Mm -hmm. It's like like a, a parallel universe, uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So so many great impressions. And that that was wow. the moment when I said, okay, I, I need to do this professionally. I need to, mm. I need to stay there. Yeah. Mm. Sure. That's so amazing. Mm -hmm. It's it's more or less I, I found my uh, yeah my passion for teaching for coaching uh, and to help other people uh, also get better storytellers get uh, yeah. yeah better it's more mm -hmm. successful um, communication in place mm -hmm. less mistakes uh, effectively efficiently yeah that's that's what I'm doing. Mm. Um. And so I, I guess I've got a, a bit of a question maybe to try and put everything into context because chief storyteller is a, a pretty big word and you've kind of like spoken a little bit about um, about how you kind of got into it. But like maybe can you give us an idea of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Because you've spoken a little bit about stories, sure. you've spoken about presentations, spoken about a bit of coaching and workshops. So like what, what does maybe like a typical day or an average day look like for you? Yeah, you're right. This is this uh, this term, chief storyteller, is always like uh, when when I, I I tell people about that, usually they say wow, and the <laughs> next thing they say is huh. <laughs> so what is it? <laughs> the funny thing was, it, it, the same happened to me when I was offered this job three years ago. Uh, I think it took me two and a half milliseconds to say yes, and then the second question on my mind was, okay, tell me what is it? <laughs> I was in love with the title, but I had no idea what it was all about. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, let me tell you what it is not, because many people confuse this job with uh, with um, yeah things like uh, some people think I'm I'm the fairy tale uncle at SAP and inventing all those. Uh, fancy stories that are being told to customers. No, 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 that's not what I do. I'm not the once upon a time person. And we can mm -hmm. talk about the, the real meaning of story in my world maybe later. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the second thing I'm not, because many people confuse me with that, is a jukebox or a vending machine where you put in some coins and then a story pops out. <laughs> that's not <laughs> really what I'm doing. Okay, I, I wouldn't say I'm not doing this, but the problem is it, it won't work with coins, okay? You, you get my point. <laughs> 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 no, that's that's uh, no. But I, what I'm really doing is I'm really, as I said, it's uh, the storytelling is already there. Yeah, it just mm -hmm. needs to be activated. Many people. So I love this this metaphor. Uh, as as I have been a, a musician, well, I'm still a musician, but not a professional. And I love to play piano. So my the piano keyboard is always a metaphor that I'm like that I like to use. And I see many people in business when they are presenting, they are only playing middle C all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not music. It's just annoying. Mm. Yeah? 
This means uh, there's so many beautiful keys on the keyboard with different sounds yeah, mm -hmm. and different emotions that you have. You have the, the, the low ones and the higher ones. And you can mix them. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is to uh, help them explore this keyboard, which is there in everybody. And to also, yeah, be... Um, this, this is like like a shell. If you only play middle C, you are hiding mm -hmm. your emotions, which which mm -hmm. is safe. Yeah, It's a safe place. It's a comfort zone. But mm -hmm. I think uh, if you want to convince people, if you want to change their minds, you need to uh, attach uh, or you need to connect with them on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is really to teach them at least once in their life to to go beyond middle C, to to explore the first octave. And then we go. And at the end of, of my, my trainings, I want them to play uh, Rachmaninoff. Okay, which is the uh, mm. the one composer who has used the keyboard mm -hmm. extensively, all mm -hmm. of the keys, and that does not mean that they have to do this in every customer meeting. Yeah? It's not not the goal. Some of my managers got really uh, um, yeah, anxious about it that I'm turning uh, their employees into into crazy stage people who are <laughs> freaking out every time. No, that's not what I mean. I just want to say it's uh, it's adaptiveness that I'm mm. looking for. It's really like that you, mm. you you come into a new situation. You have an audience in front of you, and what I recommend is to try uh, to try out. Okay, what is appropriate? Yeah. So you start mm. with middle C. Well, obviously they like that. Then you explore a little bit. Go one octave, still good. Yeah. Second one. Oh yeah. Third one. Oh, stop here. Okay. Do you get a sign from the audience that's going to be too much? Mm -hmm. And then you stop. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But you, you know you can. This freedom I want to introduce, that they are able to to adapt to the audience, to, to uh, adapt the level of storytelling, the different shades of storytelling that we can do, and mm -hmm. to give the customers, the audience, yeah, what they want in the yeah. way they want it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what, what creates the successful communication in the end. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That's my job. Yeah, wow. I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm trying to put this story, uh, the missing story gene into the DNA mm -hmm. of people and to make yeah. it second nature. Yeah. I'm almost um, envious of people that work at SAP because they have access to someone like you. You know, it would be oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe can we get into the topic of storytelling? If, from your perspective, what is it to be a good storyteller? What does that mean? Yeah, first of all, I would say it's a uh, story is... Um, often misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So there's many people when they hear about storytelling training, uh, the, the reaction is, oh, great, another storytelling training. Yeah. So it has been overused and there have many, many storytelling trainings are very narrow focused on, mm -hmm. for example, you're going to learn about the hero's journey, the classical mm -hmm. um, Greek um, drama with mm -hmm. um, um, increasing drama, then you have the high point, you have the resolution and the happy end or the not the happy end if it's uh, a tragedy. Yeah, but this is this is it's great, and nothing wrong with uh, Greek, uh, Greek Greek drama. And, and if you look at current cinema movies, they are all following the same plot. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you look at Harry Potter or James Bond or Star Wars or all the, the great movies, Hunger Games, they are all having these protagonist antagonist uh, the tension. Um, that's that's how storytelling works in in cinema and in books. The problem I have with that is uh, in business, it's not the same. Yeah. In, in, a, in a murder mystery, you can you can keep people attached to the story for one and a half hours yeah? mm. by, by keeping the suspense and, and only giving the, the, the resolution at the end. But in business, that, that doesn't work. Nobody's yeah. going to give you one and a half hours to, to resolve the, the miracles that you put on the table. So, and, uh, so what we need in, in uh, business is a much broader uh, definition of story. And that's what I'm trying to, to get across. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, there is many things that people wouldn't have on their radar screen in terms of story. So, for example, uh, money. Mm -hmm. So if you hear money, it's not the first thought, uh, yeah, story. No, it's not, right? But money is a story. It's, it's, by the way, one of the most successful stories that have ever been told. Because if you look at these, these uh, little uh, colorful paper mm -hmm. bills, they are actually, the, the value of these is nothing. It's just paper. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you burn them, they're gone. But everybody is, is hunting them. Everybody wants them, yeah? Uh, and not because of the paper. It's not that you're into, into colorful paper. That's not what it is. <laughs> but as soon as you hold them in your hand, there is a story being told in your mind what you can do with the money. So mm -hmm. it's a placeholder for, money, for stories. And at the same time, it's only valuable because so many people worldwide believe into the value. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a common story that we tell around money. 
And uh, if you go to a different planet and find some extraterrestrial intelligence, they might look at you and say, uh, so what? What is this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they don't share this story. Yeah? So mm -hmm. that is, for example, one story. And mm -hmm. uh, what I what really drives me crazy is sometimes in business, people say, ah, yeah, stories is cinema, movies, books, but not in business. Business is facts and yeah. numbers. Yeah. Yeah? I call it sometimes the four F, the features, functions, facts and figures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what we are doing in business. It's rational. It's logical. And no, it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. and storytelling is, is part of the business I take it even further I say a business is a story yeah and if it's a great business if it's a sustainable business then it's a great story that we are telling so for example SAP now celebrates this year the 50th birthday and uh, so that means we are telling the SAP story since 50 years and the the share price is the measure of the quality of our storytelling because if we are telling great stories to the public to our customers to to everyone who is attached with this company then they uh, believe into the story and that mm -hmm. means they put their money on the table and say okay i want to be part of this success story if it's a bad mm -hmm. story like if there's a scandal or something yeah if there's a uh, bad treatment or what what comes more and more the sustainability uh, the green line story yeah are we treating the planet nicely are we caring about the environment then you get bad marks and then you're telling a bad story and you're out of business sooner or later mm -hmm. so that's for me mm -hmm. business is a story and uh, talking to designers uh, that's that's one of the most powerful stories i think are there uh, out there which i call uh, implicit storytelling Mm -hmm. These are the stories that, that you don't hear because they don't have words. So most people think storytelling is about words and, and speaking, but mm -hmm. uh, some yeah. of the best stories are told um, just without words. So, for mm -hmm. example, if you have a, a, a beautiful app, yeah, you have downloaded a beautiful app on your smartphone and you really love it because it's easy to use, it's simple, uh, intuitive. What, what are you going to do? You're going to tell your friends and say, hey, you need to download this. It's fantastic. Yeah? It made my life so much easier. So you see, mm. the design, a good design, triggers storytelling. That's mm -hmm. why I call it implicit stories, because you are doing the design and some other people are telling the great stories about it. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part of implicit storytelling is the behavior. So that means how are we treating people in our environment? Uh, do we care about them? Are we helpful? Are we generous? Are we, um, yeah, caring is the word, yeah? A good caring means, if I, for example, somebody um, drops their, their shopping bag from, from a grocery shopping yeah, and, and all the, the fruits and the vegetables are spread over the, over the pavement. And I'm there. Yeah? So what do I do? I go there and help them mm -hmm. to, to put everything back into the bag. There is yeah. no single word maybe except, hi, can I help you? Yeah? But that's not a story, right? And not a verbal story. But, but helping this person, yeah, they will go home and say, hey, you know, there's still nice people out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this is this is also part of storytelling, and I'm trying to take this really broad because also when we talk to our customers, it's not about the pitching, it's not mm -hmm. about the 30 minutes or one hour demo that we are giving about our products, but it's how does it continue? Are we following up on questions? Are we uh, asking back? Does everything work? Do we remember next time what happened before? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just an example: you are meeting some uh, customer that you haven't seen for let's say half a year or, or longer and you meet in a cafe and you still remember that this person prefers a flat white with one piece of sugar. Mm. That is a story mm. yeah? because the other person feels you care about them. Yeah? You remember things. Yeah? So this is all part of storytelling. I'm trying to really get this broad scope mm -hmm. into the game because I think uh, with this uh, classical Greek storytelling, Uh, we are not really um, yeah. doing ourselves a favor in business. This is what I tell my colleagues. If you can write 45-minute long stories or even longer, which keep your audience attached all the time and they are sitting like yeah, in, 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 in a trance-like state, then quit your job yeah, and go to Hollywood. You're going <laughs> to be the next screenwriter. Yeah? You, you're creating the next big TV series. But don't waste your time in business because if you have mm. this talent, you need to be, uh, you, can, you can do much better and you can be yeah, mm. uh, much happier in, in, a, in a writer's job. Yeah. Yeah. So we need those short anecdotes, those small stories that we can tell to make a point, to change people's minds, to, yeah, to, to drive change, yeah, to, to make the world run better, as we say in SAP, and uh, improve people's mm. lives. I like this. So, Thank you very much. 
there's, there's, there's something that I wanted to um, hone in on um, specifically. So, and I'll give a little bit of context um, first. And the, the area I wanted to hone in on was the part that you said, like the sort of acting out of a story. And so the reason why this, this kind of piqued a little bit of interest for me, um, one of the areas that I was kind of interested for a while was um, one of the analytical psychologists called like Carl Jung. And he kind of, in one of his books, he kind of went into, um, he, he traveled to Africa and spent some time with a uh, one of the local tribes. And one of the things that was really interesting was um, some of the experiences he had around rituals. And um, especially, you know, when you think of, for example, those, the, the type of experiences that include like a lot of dancing and music and a, a sort of like camp type environment. And you know, for, for a long time, stories were told not as a string of words, but rather almost like a play. You know, you have a group of people who are telling a story through their actions and through the motion and through the music and through the, the you know, I mean, sometimes the, the, all of these stories we hear about uh, the tribes that use things like ayahuasca and all of these kind of like sensory stimula- um, stimulating um, substances. And I feel like that's an, er- an element of stories especially um, in the current time that is sort of faded out. And that's sort of like the embodied stories. Um, and I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts on that or, or, or anything that comes to mind in that, in that specific topic. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that was the beginning of storytelling was uh, language came very late to the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the reason why we are storytellers and the reason why, why this is so important um, is uh, because we are not um, not like, uh, for example, some some cats. Yeah, they are living alone. They are they are um, they know how to live their life. They don't need anybody else. Yeah, just once upon, once in a year they are uh, doing some some mating and um, making sure the that the the species does not um, does does survive. Yeah, but that that's it. But human beings are not like this. Human mm. beings always have been social beings. We are depending mm-hmm. on each other. Even if some of us uh, deny this, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we need this. And currently, j- look at the pandemics now, the, all the lockdowns that we had, uh, how much we suffered from being um, not able to see other people, not to see our families, not to see our friends, not to travel. So that's that's part of the human nature. And we were depending on that because, for example, let's say uh, you're you're part of a, of a tribe back 10,000 years back and, and you are... Um, you made an observation that is that is uh, important. You found an, a place where, the, where you can get water. You find a place where where there is maybe a predator running around, and uh, mm-hmm. better better not go there. Okay, so how do you make sure that you are communicating this to your to your uh, to your folks? Yeah, so that that you can help mm-hmm. them uh, get food, get water, uh, and avoid trouble. Mm-hmm. So that is the beginning of it. Yeah. And in the beginning, it was, of course, like, uh, yeah, um, gestures and um, paintings. The, the cave paintings are, are also storytelling. Mm. It's a visual way mm. of storytelling to uh, explain strategies, for example, hunting strategies. Yeah, you can, you see mm-hmm. in those uh, cave paintings, there's the mammoth and there's the, the people with the, with the um, weapons. Yeah, and they, they are painting a strategy on how to kill a mammoth. Mm. That is also part of, of storytelling. So it's, it's visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. It is this, uh, yeah, like gesturing, like body language, and um, yeah, and then later the language came, and language was just a sophisticated way of sharing the emotions. But it's all about that. It, it's mm-hmm. all about sharing emotions so that I can transfer my inner state to the outside audience, to to mm-hmm. someone else, that they can feel with me. This mm-hmm. empathic uh, idea behind that, yeah. And when you are watching a movie, for example, yeah, mm-hmm. it's so funny in my world. You have a two-dimensional representation of a fictional reality. We all know there's green screens. We all know there's computer technology to to create special effects. But and we know this consciously. But we are sitting in the cinema watching this big screen, and we feel. Yeah, this is the reason why people go to the cinema because of the feelings, not because of mm. the visual effects and the audio. It's the result. It's the feeling. Yeah, it can be scary. It can be. Um, uh, it can be. Um, uh, make you cry in the cinema it can be uh heartwarming all the spectrum all the the piano keyboard is there but still it's a fictional two-dimensional representation of something that does not exist yeah and -hmm. this is the power of storytelling that we that we can take people on a journey in their minds follow us and share our emotions share our experience and and this this was always the the idea behind it it just got more Mm -hmm. and more sophisticated it's still not good 
yeah. our language <laughs> is far from being good. There's so many ambiguities in mm. in communication. There's so many uh, so room for interpretation. You know that when you're writing an email, uh, how mm -hmm. many ways people can interpret what you're writing. Yeah, you thought you have communicated clearly, but you get so many questions back that you would not uh, anticipate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did, yeah. Let me quick quick story. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was in one of the big conferences and I, I didn't read the, the email carefully, talking about emails. And I, I forgot my tie. It was business attire. So I, for, I had a suit, but I didn't have a tie. And it was the first time I was on this big conference and I didn't want to uh, to leave a bad impression. Okay, So uh, I thought, okay, let's let's write an email to my boss and ask if he has a spare one. Okay, That was in the morning. It was America. We were jet lagged. And I'm writing at, I think, 6.30. So, said, okay, when, whenever he wakes up and reads it. Okay, no. 30 seconds later, I get an email back. Thanks for waking me up! Exclamation mark. <laughs> so, obviously, his smartphone made some noise with this email and he woke up. Mm. I said, okay, this is this is a great start. Forgot your tie. Um, <laughs> beep of your boss. It's not good, okay? <laughs> so, I mm. met him in the lobby then a, a few hours later and said, hey, hey so, I'm so sorry about that. I, uh, and he said, what, what's wrong with you? I said, yeah, I woke you up this morning. Yeah, he said, yes, thank you for that. I didn't hear my alarm clock. I had so much work to do. So, if you wouldn't have wrote, wrote this email, <laughs> I would have overslept. Sure. <laughs> so, but you see, the point is, yeah. I only got the words. Thanks for waking me up, exclamation mark. But in my mind, I, I spoke mm -hmm. them out like, thanks for waking me up. But it was meant like, hey, thanks for waking me up. So yeah. you can see this difference in, in, in pronouncing the words mm -hmm. is already giving us a lot of hard times in terms of communication. And that's why, why emails are very dangerous in terms mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why people in, invented the emoticons to, to, to give this to words help. an emotional <laughs> uh, painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I see, this is, we are not yet there. Yeah, but there's still room for improvement in terms of yeah. communication a lot. <laughs> I know. definitely uh, like using emojis in emails, mm -hmm. not because yes, it looks unprofessional, but because it gives context to what you're saying. Um, if I'm not mm -hmm. using exactly. emojis, exactly. it's probably because I am very yeah. serious. <laughs> Yeah, but then you run the risk that uh, people misunderstand it. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So you both touched on the origin or the the main reference we as humans have a story of stories, which is you know rituals. Um, it is history. It is also very creative, which is our most recent and still popular dominant reference of storytelling, like cinema, Hollywood, authors, yeah. books, fiction. Um, so there's this massive perception a lot of people share, which is that storytelling is for creatives. It's for the creative, the, the you know, the artsy people in, in your company. If you say, oh, we have a storytelling workshop, cool. The designers, you can come, you know, the art directors, you can come. But it's not for management. It's not for the execs or the technical people, which is obviously, that's a misperception. How have you managed that? How have you actually convinced or proved to the organization that it is for everyone it's not just for the artsy people or the creatives mm. uh, you, uh, first of all you're absolutely right it's it's uh, this is made for everyone and the, the question is only uh do you believe into that the biggest uh, my biggest uh, little helper is um a demonstration of the power of story you know, for example let's assume mm. i have uh, talked to one of my pre-sales colleagues and um, so that these are the ones who are who are giving the the demos and answering all the questions and bonding first of all with the customer they are creating the wow. relationships with our customers and if they are great storytellers sometimes there's people sitting in the same room and they get amazed by the reaction of the customer. Yeah? If they are doing a really good roller coaster of emotions, yeah, telling the story, not like, and then you can click here, and you can click here, <laughs> and if you click here, then this happens. <laughs> yeah, I have seen one presentation that a guy was describing me, 15 minutes, all the elements on the UI. It, it, but it was a sales play. It was not a conference of UI design. It was really like, no, this is not what we want. Yeah, but we want we want an emotional ride on the roller coaster to have. Yeah, this is, this is your problem. And look at this. It's so easy. I click here, and you see the solution. And don't you want this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this this is the way it works. Yeah, getting mm -hmm. them on this ride. And sometimes people are sitting there and afterwards asking, "Tell me, where, where did you learn to do things like that?" Mm. This is the moment when when people change, mm. yeah, because then they yeah. get curious about. I want that too, yeah. Mm. And this is this is my best friend to have these these moments where people then find out 
uh, there's something that makes them more um, yeah, uh, successful, more effective, mm. more uh, efficient also, because it uh, sometimes gets much faster. So what, what I'm doing is basically when I'm, yeah, when I'm doing my trainings, I'm trying to start small because if you have this, this mountain in front of you of storytelling, uh, many people get afraid and say, ah, pff, hey, Thomas, look, look at you. Uh, I will never be there or look at Steve Jobs. I will never be like Steve Jobs. Okay, this is the, the worst comparison that you can do because you're comparing somebody who has a professional career as speaker with you at the beginning of your career as speaker, mm. which is unfair. Yeah, it's not, it's, it doesn't make sense. So I always say the, the only fair comparison that you can do is your current self with your previous self and your future self. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every day you make a small step and you get better. And next time you walk up on stage and your heartbeat is heart rate is not at 180, but at 170. That's a major success. <laughs> yeah, it goes down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, you need to take this mountain and, and put, put stairs, mm -hmm. so steps into it. Yeah? And, say, and then you, you lower your, your point of view and say, okay, ah, this is the next step. And this is the next step. And sooner or later you reach the mountaintop and uh, said it was a piece of cake. It was just steps. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is to yeah. to dissect storytelling into tools, first of all, so that they have a tool belt kind of metaphorically, of course, with a certain elements uh, to capture the attention of the audience to how to uh, create emotions, how to um, motivate someone. So all these these little things that you can use. And in the beginning, it's, this is it's like, um, you know, that when you're learning something new, Maybe you remember the first uh, time you drove a car after the um, after the driving school. Yeah, do you still? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah, driving a car? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, it was really like a big checklist in my mind. It was like, mm -hmm. okay, what do I need to do first? Uh, buckle up. Okay, then uh, mm -hmm. rear view mirror. Okay, it's good, good. Uh, what? Wow, what, what's next? Okay, uh, clutch, clutch, uh, gear. So uh, stress. Okay, because our conscious mind was driving. Yeah, mm. And this is never good because conscious mind is very slow, powerful, but <laughs> slow. And now if, you, if you're driving to work uh, nowadays, after so and so many years of driving experience, it happens to me that sometimes I arrive in the parking lot and said, how did I get here? <laughs> what happened? Where are the last 20 minutes? They're gone. I, I have no, uh, no memories of that because yeah. now my subconscious mind is driving the car the mm. so-called autopilot, not the one from Tesla, but the one built into your brain. And this is, uh, this is helping us to, to live our lives and to, to simplify this complexity mm. around us by mm -hmm. uh, turning things into skills. And that is the same with storytelling. In the beginning, it's a bit clumsy. It's a bit uh, tool-like. Yeah? So people notice you are, you're using a tool mm -hmm. on them. But over time, if you practice that a lot and if you are mm. um, um, yeah, giving you some time, it turns into a skill and skillful art is always a pleasure. But in the beginning, it yeah, it's like, like yeah. I said, with design, with paintings, with playing music, with dancing, uh, whatever we learn is a bit robotic in the beginning. And then it turns into something beautiful over time yeah. with little passion, little practice. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting there. And so this, this is what I'm trying to do in my trainings. I'm a little bit forcing that by, uh, I, I, I like to call myself brutally constructive. So I need to explain that a little bit. So constructive is, is very important in my world for learning because uh, I think we are all, as I said, we are all storytellers. So we, we are coming with a certain level of storytelling, okay, which is great. And what I'm looking at is what can we make even greater? This even is the, the, the most important word in this constructiveness because we appreciate what's already great. We talk about what could be even greater and then we give also a little advice from our own experience. How could you get there? And the best way of getting there is putting yourself in front of a camera, record yourself and then talk about the recording. That's sure. the moment when many people want to escape. They want to run away because... Uh, yeah, I remember the first time I was mm -hmm. interviewed by, by our own uh, in internal TV channel, SAP mm -hmm. TV. The moment the red mm -hmm. light went on on the camera, it's, it's 15 years ago, <laughs> when the red light went on on the camera, I could not speak. I wasn't mm -hmm. able to speak. Many people cannot imagine that I'm not able to speak when they know me. But mm -hmm. this was, I was completely shell-shocked, blocked. I was... Yeah, I, we had to go to a different place. I need to calm mm. down, drink a glass of water. And then uh, it, it worked. But camera is tough for, me, for mm -hmm. most people, being in front of the camera. And that's, that's uh, the best learning you can do. So we're doing this in our workshops 
extensively. We're recording every day. We are watching the recordings. And the cool thing is if you have one week training and you compare the video that was recorded on Monday with the one that was recorded on Friday and they see the difference, that mm. is the message to the brain. Hey, wait a second. I can improve. I can learn. Mm. Okay, what's the next step? Yeah, and mm -hmm. so so you can get this uh, change process in um, in in the motion. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's basically the idea behind that. It's brutal, mm -hmm. uh, brutally constructive, mm -hmm. but the the result is of course uh, then um, a good one. Yeah, mm. Mm. most of the times. Yeah, um, I think that's 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 amazing, and I think especially the 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 idea of of kind of like really having to face yourself and taking like step by step, um, going through a step by step process. But there's there's something that, again that I sort of want to focus in on, and that's around kind of like some of the the um, the tools that you can actually use. And I'll give a little bit of context because one of the things that I found really interesting um, when I was kind of like delving into the the subject matter of story is that you know one of the things that comes naturally to people is being able to recognize a good story. You know, you can always watch a movie and like you're watching a movie with aliens and you're watching a movie with like spaceships and all of that. But then there's something like unrealistic that the character does. And then you say, that's the thing that's not real rather than all the aliens and, and spaceships and all of, all of that. And so exactly. what we can, we can naturally tell the difference between a narrative that's realistic and a narrative that isn't, even if you've got no cinematic capability, like you couldn't write a, a um, um, a a script to an actual stick figure drawing, and so there's this 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 idea that we we can always tell what a good story is, even though we may not necessarily know how to tell a good story. Um, and then you kind of spoke about this idea of having like a tool belt that you can use with different um, strategies and approaches to actually tell good stories. And one of the ones that you mentioned. Um, just now is this idea of kind of like speaking, recording yourself, and watching watching um watching the recording. Are there any other sort of um, activities or things that a person can do? Like if we're getting like really practical and into the dirt of this, mm. like what can we do yeah. as individuals to become better if at telling stories? this is a workshop, the session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I, I will answer that in a, in a second. Just, just I wanted to quickly uh, uh, come back to what you said a bit, uh, at the beginning about the, uh, the ability to, to notice there's something wrong. And mm. I find that very interesting because this is not only in storytelling. Also, for example, if you show somebody a slide, yeah, uh, and and there is two boxes and they are they are not aligned by two pixels, mm. people will be able to tell something is wrong, but they may not be able to tell you what is wrong. It just mm. looks not mm. right. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the thing. And in stories, we also have this yeah, these antennas that tell us uh, this is. Um, fake or this is not mm -hmm. logical because mm -hmm. the, the, the good storytelling works if your audience can sit back and relax and, and always say, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, mm. yeah, I, had, I would have done the same. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what you want to get. Yeah, because uh, that is the art of, of writing a great story. And mm. I can tell you, um, I've been, um, I had the luck to, to, to visit a four day classroom training with one of the, um, storytelling, uh, screenwriting uh, gurus in mm -hmm. the world. His, and his name is Robert McKee. He has also written a book called Story, uh, where he's talking about movie making and all that. And, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, we were one and a half days dissecting the movie Casablanca. One and a half days in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a <laughs> auditorium in London, in a, in a very nice old one. And he was talking about all the tiny little bits. Yeah, So sure. that story is not just a story. It has... Uh, uh, beats they call it and um, uh, there were so many words that they used and and he explained uh, the light that they used the uh, the symbols that they use that are subliminally uh, recognized so that you know when you see the symbol again you know ah this is connecting back to this thread of the story and mm -hmm. amazing so there's so much mm -hmm. thinking and so much brain power behind the story of a movie which in the end creates the effect of us sitting there like ah, mm. Mm, uh, mm. like that yeah. So this is this is much more than we think it is. So to just to, mm. to um, come back to because I like this this uh, point that you made very much. And now in terms of the tools, well, it is basically there's there's multiple phases in in a communication. When you it doesn't matter if you give a presentation or if you are uh, uh, doing a sales play or if you are uh, having an all hands meeting or you're talking to your friends. It doesn't really matter because it is always human human communication. And mm -hmm. you know this 
the, the main currency that we have today in this um, economy that we are living in is attention. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're run, running social mm -hmm. media channels and your, your podcast, a uh, lovely podcast, this needs to compete with a million other podcasts out there. And the question is, why should people mm -hmm. stop scrolling in, in uh, LinkedIn or in any other social media? Uh, why should they just stop when um, edit undo comes? Mm. So you need to get the attention first. That's most important. And it has never been more difficult mm -hmm. in this uh, With, the, with this overwhelming amount of data and information that we are getting every day. So uh, how do you get the attention? And there's one, mm -hmm. one tool that I, I, I like very much is what we call an RFL. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm doing this <laughs> by intent. I'm going to come back to that in yeah. a second because that was already an RFL. Uh, explain that, okay? It, it is called a reason for listening, Okay. 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 But okay, I, I demonstrated it by introducing it because I, I, I said mm -hmm. it, it, it's most important to have an RFL in the beginning of your presentation. And you go like, okay, I have no idea what that is. But mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. moment when you start thinking, I have no idea what that is, I have you bound to myself already mm. because now you need me to explain this. And uh, this means you're hooked up. I see. Okay. So you know, you know this principle. Uh, There's another um, uh, story genre where they are doing this reason for listening at the end for a certain reason, and that is TV series. You're watching TV series. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Of at course. The end of every and you know episode. at the end of, yeah. yeah. They, they give you something wow. to, to chew on in your mind because you have no idea how this is going to continue. The cool mm -hmm. thing is the brain is a storytelling engine. So when you watch this, this episode and you know, okay, I have to wait for one week until the story continues, your brain is going to create a gazillion of different <laughs> stories. What could happen? But what drives you crazy mm -hmm. is you don't know which one of this gazillion stories is the one that is really true. And that makes mm. you wait for the next episode. So they, they call it the cliffhanger. You know it. And they mm -hmm. do it at the end because they want you to come back. Mm -hmm. The reason for listening, uh, I put in the beginning to get the attention mm -hmm. of my audience. Yeah, And to do, you can do that with multiple different uh, things. You can, mm -hmm. for example, um, uh, tell something that doesn't make sense. So, for example, if I would walk up on stage and say, Hi, hello, everyone. Um, from today on, money does not matter anymore. Okay, so there's yeah. two options now. Either I'm completely stupid or I have found the philosopher's stone about how economy could be done in a different <laughs> way. But there are two reasons to listen to me, yeah? Or uh, um, um, before we start, I need to make a confession. This, this word confession alone is already <laughs> a reason for listening because it is something that I normally wouldn't share. Yeah? Mm. Mm. Or things like, oh, do you want to hear about my first time? <laughs> <laughs> Most people would think this is going into another direction that mm. I want to go into, yeah? Not this first time, mm. the other. Okay, but still you don't know what it is, yeah? So this is how, how I play with the curiosity and the, 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 the brain wants to, to, to make things simple. The brain wants to close everything and go back to energy-saving mode. So and if I produce a loose end in the brain, then um, it has to stay active. And mm. we don't like this. We want it to, please close this now. Could you come to the point? Could, yeah. Yeah? So and this is, if you overdo it, it's not good. But if you do it a little bit at the beginning, you can get the attention of the audience very nicely. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, or you put a number on the screen like one million. It's impressive, isn't that? One million. <laughs> What is the question? <laughs> one million of what? <laughs> Because I didn't tell. There's no context. Yeah, yeah? And mm. there's a fantastic video. If you if you find the time uh, on on uh, TED, TED talks, mm -hmm. there's a guy called uh, Will Steven. And he, he gives a presentation with no content. He talks for 18 minutes without saying anything. This is, this is my superhero. He's, he's fantastic. Yeah? And he's, he's giving I've his seen. speech so mm. much uh, emotion that you think that, that makes sense what he's saying. But it does not because it doesn't have any content. It's a fantastic uh, it's artwork of storytelling. <laughs> yeah, really, one mm. of my favorite uh, TED Talks. Yeah? So this is basically oh, oh, uh, one... Uh, one um, um, uh, reason for listening that, that one of our former uh, board members has used very often and, and uh, it was so effective it's just one word and, and when he was on stage he went like imagine okay mm. so what, what's the question on your mind when you hear me say imagine imagine what what do you want to know mm. what, what? what? what exactly you yeah. want to know tell me what should I imagine but that means you are already 
um, willing to work for mm. me. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't get me wrong. It's, 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 this, this means because you're asking what, you're preparing your mind for this next step. Mm -hmm. The real question should be why. Why should I imagine? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just because you say. No, but, but typically the human brain is very mm. lazy and, and we get this. Imagine. Yeah, what? Okay. So and then we are ready to take it. Yeah. And this is a very powerful way of, of focusing the attention of making people ready. Or mm -hmm. let me give you another example where you can really do word magic, like like uh, using word like um, uh, very, very. Let me ask you a question. Okay. So mm -hmm. I would, would like you to think about when was the last time that you did something for the first time? You don't need to tell. It's just the, the mm -hmm. trick is this question. Okay, it is. It, it comes along as a very innocent question. I'm just curious about something that you did the first time and when it was. But what I'm doing is I'm sending you on a time travel. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You're going back in time because your brain wants to answer this. Yeah. And since I asked for something that happened in the past, you need to go back and you need to search for it. So that means I got your attention. Even if I don't care about what it was, yeah, but I get your attention for a couple of seconds. And this is how you can use storytelling elements. Yeah, and they're doing it in, in movies, in books, yeah, be, not giving away the full message, mm. keeping mm -hmm. a part secret. Maybe they have a threat that stops here, another threat is told, and you want to know how this continues. Though that's what we call nested loops. So these are all mm. techniques that you can use in storytelling that give you this, uh, yeah, keeps your audience attached, uh, makes them want to get more. And as you said, Alfie, this uh, logical, this, this, the flow, the red thread um, in your storytelling that, that people say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah? This mm -hmm. is most important because if there's one break in it, it's like, ah. Uh -uh. yeah? mm -hmm. And the problem is if people get into this conscious state, just, just look at you, it. You've, you've, you've watched a James Bond movie. I think every one mm -hmm. of you knows yeah. James Bond. Right? <laughs> We all can agree that from a conscious perspective, James Bond movies don't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this guy is is running from one building to the other. There's 25 people with machine guns duck, 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 firing at him, and he survives this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> from a conscious perspective, absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> But in the cinema, we are sitting there like, oh, hopefully, are we going to survive this, right? I say mm -hmm. we because in the moment I'm sitting in the cinema, I am James Bond. That's the reason mm -hmm. why people pay for this experience mm -hmm. because for two and a half hours I have superpowers I am I have a six pack <laughs> I have uh, I'm smart I can fly helicopters and I can do everything yeah so that feels great but mm. our brain really uh, mirrors the the protagonist in the story and that's why it works yeah so this is this is the yeah. the power of storytelling yeah. to, to yeah. take people on this dream journey and uh, if they like the journey then they want to come back but if uh, if you have one guy sitting next to you in the cinema in a James Bond movie And he tells you, hmm, you know, the likelihood of him surviving this would be 0.25%. That would kill the experience. <laughs> yeah. Happened to me once. There was, was one, one guy sitting next to me and said, could you sit somewhere else, please? That was really destroying the effect because I, I had to agree in my mind. Yeah, that, that's ridiculous. Mm. And I, I couldn't enjoy the movie afterwards anymore. Mm. You speak about something um, in storytelling which resonates with mm. me or I think came naturally to me as someone who's interested in storytelling, which is emotion. Because yeah. I think especially in um, large companies such as SAP or any other global company, you know, you have a, a global company with mixed cultures, mixed ages, genders um, and backgrounds. And mm. it can be hard to tell us to come up with a story that's relatable to everyone. But one way you can do that is with emotions because that's the one thing that we, we all share that that's easy to, to connect us. Um, and you now showed us how, you know, you can use emotion provoking some type of emotion, whether that is curiosity or um, an eagerness to stay or interest to what's happening next or angst. Um, in the beginning of a story. How would you say then, if I am presenting to business people for an hour, how do I yeah. keep that story going? What's next? The, uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a very good topic to talk about because that's, that's one of the most difficult things in storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the thing is, it can be my per personal favorite story that I tell, but it's not about me. 
Yeah, yeah. I am enjoying myself mm -hmm. a lot when I tell this story. But uh, if mm -hmm. I look into uh, the faces in my audience and they, they go like, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. then it's not a good story. Yeah, It's a yeah. great story in my world, but obviously not in the world of the audience. And mm -hmm. then it's it's the wrong story to tell. So what we need, and this is the um, the precondition for great stories, is to to do a good discovery, so that if that you know most about your audience, about their preferences, so you can research mm -hmm. their web pages, you can uh, maybe have a, a call up front where you can uh, listen carefully. So there's a there's a very old saying from a, a Greek philosopher Heraclit. He said, humans have two ears and one mouth uh, so that they can listen twice and then speak once. So it's, a, it's listening is the skill that you really find out, okay, what is your audience uh, about? What what are they dreaming of? What mm. are the, the worst nightmare, nightmares they have? And you can do this interview with them, like asking them questions about, yeah, that you show your curiosity, which is also showing your care. When you ask people about their their, their life, about their, their journey, that is always uh, regarded as interest. Yeah, and if it's true interest, if it comes from the heart and not from the brain, mm. it's always good. Okay, and then you get a lot of good information about what drives them. And mm. when you then craft your story around those drivers, around those motivational drivers, you are getting much more impact afterwards with the storytelling because then you are creating these emotions that you mentioned in their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, yeah. uh, some some people might be driven by money. Money is a very common uh, 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 motivational driver in in business. So if you find out your your uh, your your um, business partner is talking about money all the time, it's about making revenue and profits and this damn cost that we have that needs to get reduced, but we don't know how and uh, uh, and the 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 numbers at the mm -hmm. at the stock exchange and it's all about those those numbers. And you know, mm -hmm. okay, this is the money person then mm -hmm. then you can uh, pitch about saving costs increasing revenue uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe you can also add a little competition here because you also heard that it's about leaving the competition behind so how you mm -hmm. can you differentiate yourself mm -hmm. yeah and then you're telling a story about uh, which which i call um, uh, a four-wheel drive i like this this metaphor very much because if you look at the at the car with a four-wheel drive there's the two back wheels that are pushing the car forward and the two front wheels are pulling the car Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. and in storytelling, you can use this what what we call a, an away from motivation, and a towards motivation. Okay, away from is for. Uh, let let me ask you a question. <laughs> so, do mm -hmm. you like to go to the dentist? And of course, you like to go to the dentist because everybody <laughs> likes to go. To the dentist. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> this bright light that makes you look so nice, and the smell of chemicals, and the sound of the drills. <laughs> I, uh, wonderful, isn't that? Okay, no, really, not really. Huh? But I guess you go to the dentist because uh, most people go there, even if they don't like to go there. And the question is, why would why would we ever do something that we don't want? Mm. The, the reason in most cases is that we want to avoid something worse. So, for example, tooth yeah. pain mm. or the loss of teeth or uh, that, that it doesn't look nice anymore, the aesthetic aspects of it. So that means if you compare the two, bad teeth and going to the dentist the dentist is going to win, even if you don't like it. Mm -hmm. So that's what's called an away from motivation, also sometimes called a stick motivation. If somebody is behind you with a stick and, and you are trying to avoid the stick. So this is how you uh, push yourself out of your comfort zone. And the mm -hmm. towards motivation is the opposite. It's, it's something that you look forward to. So there's something mm -hmm. in the future waiting for you that's really nice. A new car, uh, a vacation, maybe it's now after two years of, of pandemics, we are all looking forward to traveling again. Yeah, So that's clear towards motivation. And yeah. if in your storytelling you find the right triggers, like for example, the money trigger or the competi competitive trigger or the uh, sustainable, one of the best ones currently is uh, the green line, Yeah, the sustainable mm -hmm. uh, motivational driver. How can you be a, a better player in this environmental game? And if you combine this mm -hmm. away from... So think about what would happen if you don't do this and then think about what will happen if you do. Mm. Then you're mm -hmm. creating those four-wheel drives that, that push and pull at the same time. And that is what makes your audience feel and uh, consider and move finally. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But you need to understand them. Otherwise, if, if you talk, for, for example, you could, you could talk to me about Formula One racing. <laughs> that will not work. I, I, I promise you, this will not work. I, you, you get not a single 
bit of inf of emotion into my body with Formula One driving. Maybe the the, the other side that I get angry about it. <laughs> that's it. <okay? laughs> But that's my world. And if you love Formula One driving, that's mm. that's great. Yeah, that's your world. Yeah. And in my world, it doesn't work. So you would have to talk to me about uh, storytelling, like we do right now. That that triggers me, or music, mm. or uh, traveling, uh, mm. uh, traveling to South Africa. Wonderful. That's that's one of my favorite topics. I miss mm -hmm. this so much. It's. I want to um, pause on just something that we we talking about, and just pause and give some more attention to it, which is what you are describing paying attention to who your audience is. And I think especially for creatives uh, that work for any company or even for yourself, a creative is usually recruited by someone who is not a creative and that's why you are hired to do the job. And that means at some point as a creative, you need to present your work, show your work, tell about your work. You are telling the story of your work to someone who's not a creative. And That is very important for creatives to, to know and be aware of because I think a lot of creatives fall into the trap of not telling the right stories when they are sharing their creative ideas or creative work. And then they are disappointed when people aren't happy with their work or don't understand where it's coming from or don't actually or appreciate the value that they are trying to share. And Alfie and I, especially, we, we both worked for um, APSA, one of the big banks here in South Africa. Yeah. And that's very important because every time we show our work, it is, it's to people who are definitely not in the sense or the typical sense creative. These are people who care about numbers, are very mm -hmm. finance savvy people, operational people. So for instance, we did this um, project for almost three months. It was a very extensive research project, how, mm -hmm. how to do personal financial management. And we were so excited about the stuff we were presenting, the ideas. And we had a presentation deck of almost about 60 slides to show oh, okay. all the insights and the recommendations because we had a lot of qualitative data from our user mm. testing. And when we wanted to present to one of the execs, we had to reduce all of this to about five slides. Yeah. In essence, if we go back to those five slides, four of those five slides had nothing in about what we actually were doing. All it had in was a title that said the value for the business And we spoke about money and what this will do for the person on the other end. And mm -hmm. even us, we've been in this industry for such a long time and we still fall in the trap because the, our work excites us so much. We, we just mm -hmm. want to share it. And then we forget that they don't really care about that 60 slides. They want one slide that's going to tell you that you are going to help our young target market grow by 30%. That's all they want to know. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that, that is the, the the pitfall that you just described that happens mm. in, in many 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 times I have I've, mm -hmm. I, I think I'm seeing uh, a thousand presentations per year easily and uh, most of them are uh, falling into this uh, being proud of, of their own work mm. uh, pit. Mm -hmm. okay and it, which is absolutely natural because it is the stuff that we are passionate about and mm. of course we want to talk about everything and share this that's that's again the storytelling is sharing our emotions with the audience just mm -hmm. again it, it's it's not about us it's about them and mm. if what you just described is a clear case of of, of uh, yeah money of course money is is a driver but mm -hmm. again uh, we talked about money in the beginning uh, it's, it's a placeholder for something else mm. Mm -hmm. so Just, just an example. If somebody uh, tells me I need to save 30% cost in my uh, business to get a better margin, mm -hmm. then for me, margin and cost reduction is not a value yet. Mm. It's not something that triggers, triggers. Uh, if I want to create a key message out of that, I need to go a little bit deeper. And this is what I call the mm -hmm. why street. So that's a pretty mm -hmm. annoying thing uh, to do with uh, other people. This is what children do and what we also have done when we were young uh, to torture our parents with this why and why this and why again, hmm? why? <laughs> and sooner or later they say, because <laughs> that's the only answer that they have because there's nothing more to come. And if you do this, for example, I could ask, why do you want to save cost? 
Okay, and then they say, yeah, we need to increase the margins. Oh, that's interesting. You're the only one doing that. Okay, uh, so <laughs> why would you want to have a better margin? Uh, what would you do with this pile of money? So I'm, I'm putting now a picture into their mind. Yeah. They're imagining mm -hmm. this pile of money that you have saved. What would you do with it? Would you just... Uh, Look at it and touch it and be happy about it. <laughs> and of course not. We want to invest it. We want to extend our business to Far East. I said, oh, that's interesting. Far East. Mm. Great place. Great marketplace. Great idea, I think. Yeah. Okay. But now I learned by just asking a couple of questions, what is the motivation behind saving costs? Mm. Because mm. almost all the presentations are about, and you can save cost here and you can do this. No, no. no. What's the core of this wish to, to save cost? Yeah, and then if you can talk about that, and then I would pitch about Far East. I would theme my presentation with uh, some Far Eastern uh, um, uh, graphics and stuff. And so to, to be in this world that they want to be in in the future. And then mm -hmm. I put all the nice features and functions that I have in my software and uh, next to it implicitly, not like this is the product you need. It's not about products. They don't care about products. They care about what does it do for them? What mm -hmm. is the benefit I get out of it? What is the value it adds to my life? And then I fall in love with the product. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the trick is to, to start with the why question. This, this is what I just described, this, this core, mm -hmm. the value. Mm -hmm. And I have this, this little story that I love to tell uh, to, to explain that uh, very quickly. I was invited to Istanbul, another fascinating place uh, to go. And uh, we had a dinner, a team dinner with uh, my colleagues in at the Bosporus, beautiful place. And uh, Turkish dinner, I didn't know how, how that works. I knew Turkish food from Germany, but it's not the same, yeah? So we had a, a, a long table and we didn't get a menu card. They were just serving. And the, the full table was covered with food. It was colorful food. Mm -hmm. I've, most of the, the dishes I have never seen in my life. And I was completely overwhelmed with information. Okay, then I, I tried to decide which one first, okay, and said, well, that, yeah, this one looks good, okay. I took a spoonful off, and then it was like an explosion in my mouth. It was like, boom. I said, oh. And then I started asking questions. I started asking the guys, okay, how is it called? What are the ingredients that go into it? Can mm -hmm. I buy the stuff when I'm back in Germany? I would have loved to go into the kitchen and ask the chef, can I, can I watch <laughs> you doing it? Yeah, because this is so fantastic. Okay, now, this is the little story that happened to me. And that nicely demonstrates this cascade of why, of the value, and then how and what. Mm -hmm. Because I would have never asked the question about the name of the dish and the ingredients and the recipe without knowing if I like it. Mm. So the first step that needs to happen is to taste it. And if you like the taste, then you are going to ask yeah, because mm -hmm. you're curious, you're interested, you want it again. Yeah, yeah that's I, I already see in my future. I'm eating this every day. Okay, I need to know how to produce it. How, where, where can I get it? Yeah, all this. So if you do translate this now into your into your business, then what you need to do in your storytelling is to give the customer the value, the the, the spoonful of this nice uh, nice dish that you have cooked in your kitchen, and if they fall in love with it, they are doing you the favor to ask all the questions about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if they believe into what you're promising, if, if the, the, the dish tastes nicely, they are going to ask you, oh, I'm losing my connection to the world. Um, they are going to ask you all those questions that you want to answer. Mm. But yeah, and how are you going to do this? I'm curious, how are you going to do this? How, how mm. would that work? Can you show me? And then you're in the game. Yeah. And if I, I can tell you one thing, uh, executives are maybe not designers all the time, but they're also users of software. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the best you can do from my world perspective is to give them an iPad. Everything that, that lives on an iPad is real, is tangible, it's known because they're doing it all day long, uh, a tablet, and you give them the tablet and say, see, this is so easy to use, let me guide you and you do it. And then they are touching the product. And when they touch the product, they are mm -hmm. already incorporating it into their world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's And then, then uh, you are going to have the chance to give all the information. You see, we, we researched this and we, we put this box here because we found out users like it. This is the first place they look at. yeah. And you can give all the, the, uh, the reasons behind. Uh, mm -hmm. But not if you do that up front, they will, it, it goes like, you know, because mm -hmm. they haven't understood the value of it. So mm -hmm. that's why I say why first, research the why, what is the why, and then give them a, a big portion of value and mm -hmm. the rest is going to come. 
That's, yeah. that's my take on it. That's what I, what I found out in uh, many, many uh, customer engagements that uh, this is uh, the best way. Because every the, the beauty about them asking questions about how and what mm. is that all your answers are going to be relevant. Mm. If you just give them information, you never know yeah. if it's relevant or not. A friend mm -hmm. of mine, uh, Bob Perry from London, Hey, Bob, if you see that, hi, like long time no see. Uh, he said something that, that stuck in my mind. And he said, uh, I, I cannot do his British accent properly, but he said, uh, sometimes we are vomiting data over our customers. <laughs> and I like this so much because it's, it's such an ugly picture. yeah. And, and you, you feel yourself sitting in the audience and somebody's, and, oh, yeah, try to get this out of your mind again. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but this is right. Yeah, it's not about this. It's not about the amount of data or the amount of of information that we are uh, giving. But it's it's uh, this one little piece that triggers, mm -hmm. it triggers the change in the mind, that triggers the desire to uh, to take the next step, and and then yeah. you get in a conversation. Yeah, then they 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 tell you how much detail they want, and you can deliver the detail because you are the designers, you are the experts. You know, mm -hmm. you can go as deep as as they wish. Yeah, but they mm -hmm. guide you, and that's the trick. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I actually have a question because, um, you know, we've spoken, we've spoken a lot about the things that you can do to actually tell a good story. And we've, we've spoken about the, the techniques that you can actually, um, you can use to do that. But there's almost like a situation that I think tends to happen, especially um, with people who kind of fall into the trap that we spoke earlier of kind of either doing the whole vomiting data on your, on your audience or, or you sort of, assume the why and sometimes you know it happens that you're at the start of the presentation and you you maybe introduce your reason for listening and it doesn't click with your customer it doesn't click with the audience and you almost need to change your your approach um you know i found sometimes like you know i've kind of think about this presentation and in my mind it's amazing i'm interested i think it's great it's a great topic and then when i introduce it like five minutes into the presentation i'm like okay I'm not hitting the hitting the mark. Do you have maybe any approach or strategy or how you might deal with a presentation that you've thought is going to go in one direction, but you yeah, are seeing spot. that it's not landing with your customer mm -hmm. or your audience? It's, that's, of course, something that I wish uh, never happens to anyone, uh, that you're completely missing the... the, the mm -hmm. So that happens sometimes mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're not getting briefed well, uh, mm -hmm. if you get the wrong information or no information at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The... Um, what what I think is, yeah, this this flexibility to change on the spot is is something that is very uh, important, and this goes a little bit into the into the uh, topic of PowerPoint and and PowerPoint mm -hmm. just as a placeholder for slideware. It doesn't matter if it's PowerPoint, Keynote, or whatever kind of mm -hmm. uh, tool you're using. It is just that I see um, a tendency that. In many presentations, or, in, or even in the majority of the presentations, PowerPoint is ruling. So I, 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 I like to ask this question, are you controlling PowerPoint or is PowerPoint controlling you? <laughs> because uh, many people, when they, when they are asked to create a presentation, they think, okay, I need to create a slide deck. But presentation, in my world, is you are presenting yourself and your mm -hmm. ideas and your work. Mm -hmm. And PowerPoint is just your, your buddy who is making it easier or nicer or em more emotional uh, that underlines your story. But the story is always first. Story comes first. You need to have a, a, your three key messages, for example, when you research your audience, if you have a chance to research your audience, that you craft mm -hmm. your key messages, that you build your stories around these three, uh, key messages. So and the, the more when you have this, this uh, when you have the right messages, let's say, you can talk about that for one minute, for five minutes, for 15, for 45, for two hours. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. because there's structure in it. The mm -hmm. more you bind yourself to a, to a presentation, the more you, you uh, uh, limit your, your freedom. Mm -hmm. And this means when, when, the, when the audience says this is not the right deck and you don't have another one, mm -hmm. then you're lost, of course. That's, that's a major, major <laughs> problem. And that's mm -hmm. why I say uh, you need to earn the right to have a PowerPoint slide. That's what I tell my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So tell me, why do you have the right to put this slide up and in front of my eyes? Who gave mm -hmm. you that right? <laughs> because sometimes it's it's counterproductive. They put a lot of text on the screen, yeah? And the problem with the human brain is text processing happens in one place. There's one module in our brain that does text. Spoken text, written text. Mm -hmm. 
inner voice, same thing. So that means when you give me a lot to read and to hear at the same time, I need to decide what do I do? Do I want to follow mm -hmm. your speech? Or do I mm -hmm. want to read what's on the slide? Me, mm -hmm. I'm a reader. If you give me a presentation with a lot of text, I'm reading it. And my hobby, my favorite hobby is to find typos. I love to spot <laughs> mistakes on slides. And so I'm fully Please in don't, the slide. Yeah, don't look at our slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just crazy, but that's how I am. And that mm. means the problem is when I'm reading your slide, I make up my mm -hmm. mind on my own. You have no control mm. about my thoughts. And as we said, mm -hmm. text is ambiguous. So I'm I'm taking a message that is not your message, maybe. Mm. But if I listen to mm -hmm. your speech, to your presentation, to your pitch, then you can guide me. And if I look like, mm -hmm. yeah, then you can you can read my face and say, okay, oh, Thomas, is there something uh, is there something wrong? Did I say something? Mm -hmm. wrong? Uh, is there something you need uh, clarification with? And then I feel like, oh, now somebody's caring about me, like that. And then I ask mm -hmm. my question, and you answer the question. Everything is fine again. Yeah, mm -hmm. but some. Um, some people don't don't even uh, use that. They, they are so much in their slides, in their speech, they don't even read the faces of the audience. Yeah? So that's why mm -hmm. I said free yourself up from those slides. Um, mm -hmm. One, you know that better than I do, one big full screen picture, you can mm. tell unlimited stories about it. One mm. picture with uh, one word limits your storytelling freedom by a, a factor of millions yeah so it, it's getting less and less two words 10 words 100 words and sooner or later you're limiting yourself that you can only tell this one single story and then you are not flexible anymore and then you get scared because mm -hmm. you know what happens if the customer doesn't like what i've prepared that's the problem yeah so sure. research is the one mm -hmm. thing if you cannot research try and uh, anticipate something you can uh, if it's if it's a company they have a web page you can read the web page you can uh, think about the style of their writing. You can think about the values that they have yeah, with their slogan, with their mission and vision so that you can uh, feel into it. So I'm, I'm in the wrong place. Normally I have always this, this pair of customer's shoes under my desk. Uh, so just imagine mm. I'm holding a pair of shoes here. <laughs> I like mm. this, this living metaphor because every time I, I go to my desk, I see those shoes and remind me of it's not about you, it's about them. Yeah, to mm. put on customer's shoes and to, to be in their world it's the best you can do. And if there's still somebody says, no, no, we don't want this, then, uh, yeah, then you need to be flexible. Give you one example. It was, was a presentation going on to a customer and the, uh, my colleague, he started t talking and said, yeah, Yo, now let me introduce you to uh, Maria, the magnificent manufacturing manager here in this company. And, and the, the, the guy get, went like this, the customer said, stop, stop immediately. Uh, this is not a good start, right? <laughs> he said, don't do this storytelling. Come to the point. Give us the facts. We have given you all the questions that we want to know. Go question by question. Give us exactly the answers and then we are fine. So that was mm -hmm. not the plan. The plan was to, to show a demo and to talk about Maria, mm -hmm. the manufacturing manager, and put it into a story form. But the customer clearly mm -hmm. said, time out. This is not what we expect. So what my colleague did is he changed his style. He changed his style completely. He said, okay, now... I show you everything one by one. And he did that. And you could see the customer turned from, from an emotional state, which was full of doubt, full of question marks, full of uncertainty, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and really negative sentiment. Mm -hmm. And after the session, all the questions have been answered and they had a smile on their face. Mm -hmm. Because that is, that is coming back to the definition of story. And mm -hmm. one, one guy saw, uh, heard about this and he said, yeah, but next time you need to do more storytelling again, yeah? No, I said wrong, <laughs> completely wrong, because this is the best story that we can tell. We have taken a customer from a negative emotional state to a positive emotional state. Mm -hmm. This is the best mm -hmm. story that you can tell in business. However you do that doesn't really matter. If you sing yes. and dance or if you talk facts and figures or if you tell a nice story once upon a time, that the customer decides mm -hmm. how they want to get pleased. And if they are pleased afterwards, mm -hmm. then we have told a great story. And the cool thing is, again, they go back to their colleagues and say, this was great today. Yeah, there was somebody who mm. really cared about me. They gave me everything I, I wanted, all the questions I answered. Great. This is a great company. So yeah. they are turning this into a story. Your behavior, mm. your, your uh, flexibility, your adaptive uh, mindset. Yeah. And this is basically so. So give yourself more freedom. That's my message. Yeah? Uh, use mm -hmm. PowerPoint just as an add-on. Mm -hmm. uh, not much text. Some, some nice screenshots, some uh, beautiful pictures with maybe one word. 
Uh, just just be careful. <laughs> I saw that on one big conference. There was this big screen, let's say 50 meters wide, uh, 10,000 people in the audience. And a board member walked up on stage and he had this Steve Jobs style, one word in, in big letters and a typo. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you only, if you only use one word, then, then you need to be careful because that leaves a, a weird impression if you are uh, uh, putting one word and this is time. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. But this is board members sometimes have these last minute requests. I'm, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that the word was different before and then the assistant has typed it quickly yeah. five minutes mm -hmm. before the show and then it was wrong. But one this is also memorable, but for the, for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So... I think we we probably need to wrap up pretty soon, but I actually just <laughs> want to comment on something on something that you said, um, and it's from a book that I, I read recently. It's called Working Backwards, and it's about um, some of Amazon's approach to innovation, and it's a very um, it's very interesting because at Amazon they stopped using PowerPoint, they actually ruled it completely out, and it's for the very reason that you said because people get so into their bullet lists. Mm -hmm and trying to speak in that exact order. And so instead, what they use is what they call the written narrative. And they instead actually write a story about the innovation that they would actually like to solve and tell it like step by step so that a person can read it and understand what you're actually, um, what, what the challenge is that the customer is facing and the approach that you'd like to do it. And a part of it is sort of this like um, collabor collaborative process of you like include frequently asked questions and people can then sort of put comments on the narrative. And I think the thing that's really important about that, that we as, as I think, especially creatives and, you know, I, I come from, um, I've got an advertising background and I know we kind of suffer from this sometimes, um, is that you kind of, you put together this pitch deck and you put together this, um, this idea, but you don't actually think about what you want to say. You don't actually think about the problem that you're addressing. You've just got a bunch of slides that look nice. And then you sort of kind of just like use your power, let your PowerPoint guide you through a, a presentation. But instead, what they're saying is like, if if the idea that you're presenting um, or this sort of innovation approach is as strong as you think it is, it should be just as valuable in a written format, in a spoken format or whatever format you put it in. So I just think it's 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 interesting that, you know, one of the most successful companies uses narrative as their core like innovation strategy mm. um and it's, i guess it's and I, when, mm. I, when i heard this uh, i loved it from the very first moment i just a little bit uh, feeling pity for powerpoint because it's a great tool <laughs> just that people misuse it is is the problem mm -hmm. and uh, i've That's seen true. people do crazy stuff in powerpoint i've seen the tutorial how you can create a chessboard in three dimensions in powerpoint so it's it's unlimited wow. what you can do with it just mm -hmm. uh, not text there has been a uh, Microsoft has been smart. They have thought about that and created another product with a, a W on it. It's called Word, but nobody knows it. <laughs> Everybody's writing into PowerPoint slides, which is like torturing yourself. Anyway, yeah, that, that's that's the the thing. It's uh, and I love this backward thing because if you if you come if you start with the outcome, yeah, I think mm -hmm. they they're doing the press release first. They are, they are mm -hmm. writing the press release mm -hmm. that should be in the newspaper or on mm -hmm. the television, and work backwards and say, okay, what needs to have happened before. Mm -hmm. That's a very smart way of doing it because you have this towards motivation, as I talked about it, yeah. This, mm -hmm. this future picture that you want to reach, and this is, has a lot of traction, yeah. And then, then okay, you want to get there. How can I get there? And mm -hmm. This is a very strong drive, like yeah. this very much, yeah. Just I think it was a bit too drastic to to ban PowerPoint, but maybe it's, it's just a transition, <laughs> yeah. So we can come back to yeah. it when people have been cured, and uh, so that's maybe, that's yeah. true. I think Amazon well, is a very secured. drastic company. <laughs> That's true. Um, no, so I think good. very, very good. I, I think we 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 probably need to wrap up. We've been going for, you know, what seventy seven minutes and then counting. Um, and to be honest, I think chatting with you, I could go on for a lot longer. But I think for the sake of our listeners, Likewise. let's maybe so um, let's maybe um, wrap it up. So I guess to close, is there is there maybe anywhere that people could kind of look out for you? Whether you've got any talks coming up soon. Um, you know, I don't know if you've got some kind of a place that you post articles or any kind of content. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, mainly mm -hmm. uh, in my SAP role. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, from time to time, if I have something uh, interesting to share, I'm writing some articles. And uh, I am uh, yeah, I'm, uh, currently I'm running a podcast inside SAP, which is not publicly uh, available, but I'm thinking That's about cool. also to, to go public 
with certain topics. Of course, I cannot talk about internal things. That's mm -hmm. clear. And uh, yeah, and the other the other channel, I have a little business running um, next to my SAP employment. Mm -hmm. So as I said in the beginning, I'm uh, very interested in neurolinguistic programming. So mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm I'm a trainer for NLP. Mm -hmm. and uh, have a little business uh, that I'm running here in Germany and uh, also a podcast attached to that but it's in German and so that ah, is uh, okay. the only drawback uh, it's not uh, it's not an international one but I'm, I'm have a lot of a lot of ideas on how to uh, extend this mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, currently I'm, I'm starting my social media ambitions uh, it's, it's not yet full -blown. okay fair Amazing. enough but I think yeah people could but, Find it's Thomas Schütter on LinkedIn. So if you're listening, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely reach out. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, this conversation has been proof that you will have a good time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And, and thanks again for, for having me in this fantastic podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, it was such a pleasure and fun uh, talking to you. I, I just look at the, the time and say, okay, one or 20 minutes. And, <laughs> and uh, thanks for that. It's been amazing. Thanks so much, Thomas. It was really a valuable conversation. Learned a lot. Mm -hmm. and for everyone listening thank you so much for this time that you've given us and have a great day further that's a wrap cheers guys cheers bye bye